I think it's the principle of non-aggression. Your right to uh, to swing your fist kind of ends at my face. Your right to swing your disease-ridden bullshit ends at my immune system. <laughs> to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. Welcome back, friends and fans, to the Lions of Liberty podcast, where I strive to advance the ideas of liberty daily, and you have found yourself here at episode number 91. Before we get into today's show, I want to take a second to let you know about Health Excellence Select, an amazing alternative to Obamacare, which utilizes health sharing to cover your medical costs. That's Health Excellence Select. For more information, head over to lionsofliberty.com slash health. My guest today holds multiple degrees in chemistry and forensic science. She runs her own blog at sidebabe.com. She is, of course, the science babe herself, Yvette Guinevere. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Hi, Mark. Thank you for having me. Well, Yvette, thanks so much for coming on the show today. I want you to start off by giving us a bit of your background. Obviously, you've had a big interest in science for some time. So how did this all come together for you to take that interest and decide to channel it into the Science Babe blog? Well, it's um, a long time ago. I, I majored in chemistry and theater, uh, deciding that I wanted to be Yvette the Science Dudette. So becoming the Science Babe, close enough, right? Um, but, babe uh, Dudette, sure. <laughs> yeah, it's, I was close. You know, it's doing the science babe thing. Uh, it kind of started, I was interested in, for a while in busting pseudoscience. I really became a skeptic. Uh, it started with watching the show Bullshit uh, by Penn and Teller. Uh, and that kind of started me on getting interested in libertarianism as well. Uh, but we'll get into that in a minute. But uh, what started me with the blog, I think, was uh, was seeing Vani Hari, the food babe, uh, going after the pumpkin spice latte and saying it was toxic. I'm like, hold on a second there. Don't go after something I love. <laughs> So, you know, it's the uh, the whole thing with um, white girls loving our pumpkin spice lattes. It's true. Do not um, mess with the latte. Don't, 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 go after, don't go after a Bostonian's pumpkin spice anything. Um, it's, <laughs> it's dangerous road. It'll make me start a website about you. Um, but, you know, she was using really horrible science to say that this thing was, was it had a toxic dose of sugar, um, that this ingredient, the caramel coloring, was a carcinogen. And she was blowing everything completely out of proportion. So I tried to explain you know, step by step why everything she said was completely just not correct. And, you know, it it, be, it took off really quickly. And I mean, pretty much every single week that I've been up, I've gotten another thousand followers. So it started off just being, you know, a, a bit of a spoof on the food babe. And it's really expanded from there. You know, we've done uh, vaccines, GMOs, homeopathy, um, supplements, like some nutrition myths. And it, it just, you know, it started being very narrow, kind of poking at the food babe. And then uh, it's it's gone on from there. So, you know, we, we aim to dispel myths and not let people spend their money on a bad bill of goods based on pseudoscience. Yeah, and your main focus over there is basically dispelling a lot of things you see as myths or as propaganda or as just plain false information that people might be putting out about things like GMOs, vaccines, and that kind of thing. Your your yep. overall goal is to just, I guess, put actual scientific information out there about this stuff in an entertaining way, I would say. You have a, yeah. an interesting style, you might say. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I mean, the tagline for the site uh, was, come for the science, stay for the dirty jokes. We're shopping a book right now that's called Science Babe's Guide to BS Detection, and there's quite a bit of my dirty humor. Uh, woven through the book while I'm giving kind of 10 rules to help people detect if they're being sold bad science. Because it's there's no clear line between good science and bad science. Like so, you have to look for the hallmarks of it. You know, like little uh, you know clues when you're you know when you're reading a study or when you're looking at a meme online. It's like okay, is, is my uncle you know sending me a, a a forward that's for real or is this thing you know is this bullshit? Does biotin really make my hair grow longer or is this you know is this another bullshit supplement? <laughs> you know what's uh, what's real? So it's like. I'm trying to arm people to be able to, you know, tell for themselves when they get a piece of information, you know, is this reputable? I want people to be informed consumers. And we'll get into a few of the subjects that you that you tackle often on your blog in a second. But, you know, you have appeared on a few libertarian podcasts. You do self-identify as a libertarian. So why don't you get a little more into how you first started to identify as a libertarian? I, I know you mentioned the Penn and Teller show. Uh, and what, what is exactly does being a libertarian mean to you? 
it's I think you look for because uh, I mean I think there are some things that that you need government around to tackle but I think you look for the way for the free market to handle it first and I think that the free market can handle a lot more things than we give it credit for today uh, both from the liberal side and from the conservative side I um I don't think people like to hear this I worked on the first Obama campaign heathen get off my show <laughs> I know right and I, I just became so um, disillusioned with how I saw he was working after that. And I mean, I think he's done a few good things because, I mean, being a libertarian, I'm very far to the left socially. And I saw even then I saw some of the things he did, like with the NSA and, you know, he was still the same warmongering president that George Bush was. I'm like, is this, you know, what's this, this is still the same president on so many things. And I think that, you know, we, we don't need to be empire building. We don't need to be, you know, starting wars in other countries. Um, there are certain things we don't need to be doing with government that both parties are going to continually do. I think that um, at least identifying as a libertarian is something that I can try to stay objective with myself. It doesn't really affect my view as a scientist uh, because I still look for the studies for that kind of stuff. But I, I try when I'm looking at politicians to say, OK, how are they going to tackle this from, you know, it's are they going to look to the free market to settle something first? Or are they going to say, can I handle this <laughs> by throwing t- by taking away people's tax yeah. dollars? First? And nowadays, more often than not, they're going to say, oh, I can handle this. I, I'm, I'm the politician. I'm the one that was elected. Uh, I'll come up with some law to figure yeah, this and out. It, and I mean, even even as libertarians, I think a lot of times the libertarian candidates are a lot of times Republicans in disguise. And sure. that doesn't fit well with me because, you know, they're. My heart is still kind of with the liberals a lot of the time, you know, at, at least socially. Like, it's, I, I don't think, you know, the, I, I think a lot of times the libertarian candidates are going to do things uh, socially that I don't like. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's a hard thing for me, uh, you know, to, to get to wrap my head around. So it's, you know, I when it comes time to voting, I, you know, I, I, I'm not out to publicly endorse uh, a candidate uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm coming at like my I don't want to say my public persona, but my what i'm uh, what i'm doing is all to be a public scientist for people um I, and i mean i'll endorse policies um but i don't want to come out and endorse a person <laughs> so i think that's that's kind of a safer thing for me to do right. so but i think I, i'm trying to find policies that are going to be very pro science gotcha cuz i mean your focus is on the science not on the politics per se yeah. your your blog is not about being a libertarian it's about being a it, interested yeah. in science interested in getting to the core of things absolutely and I, w- I want people to understand that like whichever like side of an issue you can be on you can be pro-science but I, I think that both republicans and democrats not necessarily the politicians but uh both sides of the issue have some things that are anti-science um like yeah, on the liberal side because the liberals do like to think they're the pro-science side but then there are a lot of them that are anti-gmo Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of worrisome to me. Like it's, I was, um, I, I was in Boston giving a couple talks in January, and I got literally yelled at by some anti-GMO people. And I mean, Boston, very, very liberal. There are the people that, they, like I said, they think they're the pro-science party. You know, they need to get their house in order. So it's, and I mean, on the the Republican side, it's it's on the left, it's the. Um, uh, what should we call it? It's the anti-corporation science. On the right, it's the anti-religion science that comes out. So I mean, they both have things that they have a blind spot for. Oh, well, they're they're anti-science when it fits the agenda, pro-science when it fits the agenda, right? I mean, it's it's, it's exactly. whatever they the preconceived notion is. Well, they'll try to find whatever fits into that, regardless of what's actually true. Exactly, and I mean, I just go to what does the study say? Tell me what the study says, and I or what broad scientific consensus says, and I will support it. I, I and I mean, I'm not. I'm not coming at it from one doctor or, you know, the, the accusation is always, you know, that I'm shilling for Monsanto, which I've never, I am waiting for the damn paycheck from them. Like, <laughs> like please let, you know, I'm driving a 2009 Corolla with 206,000 miles on it. Please let them send I, me some money. I've got, I've got an 04, so I got you beat, uh, but I don't it, have that many miles yet. I'm only on I, 96 or so. I, I did a lot of driving. <laughs> one of my jobs, I had a bit of a commute, but you know, it's like, well, if they can send me some money, that'd be great. But these companies are, are doing, you know, good work, but but there's always a blind spot because they're, you know, they're evil according to one side. <laughs> well, let, let's start with that that issue, the GMO issue. That's what first got you into this countering the food babes claims yeah. about your pumpkin spice latte. So, you know, let's just get to the core of it. What exactly is a GMO? There's so much propaganda and information out there. It can be hard to really sort that out because it seems like a very broad term to me, genetically modified organism. I mean, humans have been genetically modifying things for hundreds of years, hundreds of thousands of years. So 
Yeah, I mean, well, let's go ahead and say there's there's hybridization. And I mean, we have been, you know, changing the way the crops look. I think the oldest human skeleton they found is 400,000 years old. Um, so, I mean, we've been doing the agriculture thing for about 10,000 years. Like, they found corn is actually a derivative of an, a, an older crop called teosinte. Um, and they found, like, one branch of that that they've modified into corn. And I mean, in order to uh, to genetically modify something, I mean, when you hear GM anything, people think it's a Franken food. And you always get this vision of, of a fish gene. I don't know why they always get the vision of a fish <laughs> gene being put in a, into a tomato, but it's always fish. Can't they go, I don't know why they can't get a little more creative, make it, you know, make it a horse, make it, make it a donkey, make it a jellyfish, but it's always a fish. Um, but here's what people need to remember. There are tens of thousands of genes that make up something. We share about 50% of our, our DNA with a banana. Are we made of bananas? No. Like When you insert one gene into something, it does not make it that thing. You've changed one gene to give it a desirable trait. Um, it's, and I mean, in some cases, it's for hardiness um, so that it's going to survive better through a harsh season. Um, some cases, it's so that it's going to uh, not, like, it, I know with, with wheat, there's a certain fungus that attacks it called rust. And I mean, that's been a bane of farmers for years and years and years. In, in some cases, I know that a, a big concern of people has been Bt corn because we've genetically modified it to create a bacteria that's used as a pesticide. Bt is actually an organic pesticide. Yes, we use pesticides in organic farming. Um, Bt is completely harmless to people. It's just really bad for bugs. And the way I like to explain that to people is that chocolate is really bad for dogs fine for humans, wonderful right. for humans. It, it doesn't make chocolate a poison oh, yeah, for exactly. us. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, you can die if you eat 90 pounds of milk chocolate in one sitting. I, I don't Sounds like a challenge. That. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Someone's like, challenge accepted. So, you know, death by chocolate could be a thing. But, you know, like, whenever you see someone uh, doing that whole, like, syringe into a, a tomato thing, the way that they put BT into organic plants is with a syringe. They don't put it into uh, into the GMO stuff with the syringe. They make it make its own toxin. So you actually can't wash it off the organic plants. When they say, "Yeah, it's fine and organic. We can wash it off." No, 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 no. <laughs> you cannot. Um, so I mean, wait, what, they actually inject toxins into organic plants? Yep. Well, that doesn't sound um, I don't know organic <laughs> <laughs> by their definition anyway. <laughs> It's just uh, whenever they say organic is now the only way you can get something without pe you can guarantee it doesn't have pesticides grow it in your backyard um, and that that's very that's a very libertarian thing to do um, <laughs> but I mean the the organic stuff uh, they just use a different class of pesticides the way it's classified as organic is the pesticides have not been altered in a lab um, and in general pe uh, the synthetic pesticides are safer uh, because you don't have to apply them as often the LD50 the lethal dose of them is higher like they're not as toxic as your organic pesticides you're much safer going with um, your synthetic pesticides there have been more cases of people getting e coli poisoning from organic crops because they use literally bullshit <laughs> they use um fertilizer poop um for hmm. the fields um and they're they're not as they're and they're not as careful with washing practices I sounds, believe. sounds delicious so, i mean yeah go ahead and use and buy your organic produce i mean but you're you're gonna have some problems with it so i mean it's the reason that we keep on you know we we keep on advancing what we're doing with this is because we want you know more efficient farming practices so where do you think the um the sort of anti-gmo stuff comes from does it come from is there a, a even a morsel of truth in it. I mean, how, how did this anti-GMO stuff start? Because to me, in many ways, I think it, it you know, you see all these anti-Monsanto protests, and, and I think there are legitimate reasons to criticize Monsanto, the company, in terms of, you know, one of my past guests, Hunter Lewis, he wrote a book. He's uh, from AgainstCronyCapitalism.org. He's written several books on crony capitalism, and I asked him what the most crony capitalist company is, and he named Monsanto as the most crony capitalist company really? in the United States. He said one of the oil companies maybe, but... Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, there's a, if you're a major corporation, you're probably carny capitalists here right yeah, in, in, in some way shape or form but i think a lot of maybe a lot of legitimate criticisms on monsanto maybe on some of their practices and some of their government policies that seems to maybe get lumped in with all things gmo as if those are the same things as if the technology is the same as maybe a, a legitimate claim against that company what are your thoughts on that it's well i mean i think maybe a, I, one of the uh big things i always hear is that they sue farmers for having a few grains of, of their roundup ready soy going into their field that's never happened that is not 
a thing that's happened. I mean, and whenever you hear about that happening, it's always in some documentary on Netflix and the person's face has been blacked out. Um, that's literally not a thing that's ever happened. Um, I think one of the complaints about them is that they patent their seeds. I think people are kind of suspicious of that. I'm not sure exactly how seed patenting works or, you know, I mean, they, they invented something, you know, they have the right to, to, uh, to patent it. But I mean, that that's kind of free market right there. Um, I, you know, uh, I wouldn't call a patent f- exactly free market. <laughs> well, I mean, here's the thing: with a free market exists within, you know, underneath a government that that controls it, right? Again, I'm a chemist, not a uh, n- not a lawyer. Right. I don't know exactly how the how patent law works in this, but I think one of the one of the more legitimate criticisms is the patenting of the seeds, um, and I think it comes off of that. And then people say, but then people say they control the food supply. But I look at people and say, you control what you purchase, right? So, I mean, don't say they control the food supply when you can go out and not buy um, what they're selling. Do do you think it creates a little suspicion when uh, just, you know, you have the FDA that basically controls all the testing on food, on GMOs, on that kind of thing. And there is definitely some kind of revolving door between companies like Monsanto and the FDA. And maybe it's legitimate because those are the experts in the field. So in a way that might make sense. But do you think that just having the FDA sort of control the the what is approved, what isn't in sort of their own monopoly over the whole over the whole food? supply basically do you think that just maybe creates a suspicion that doesn't even need to be there it's i think people get this vision of like everyone at monsanto just going out for drinks with all the people at the fda and they're just laughing it up and just sticking (laughs) poison to the food supply like oh yes we're going to give the american public this horrible toxic thing this week and look the autism rates rise cheers and beyond you go and have it while we're sipping back no that's that's totally not what happens. I mean, well, here's the thing. I used to work at another pesticide company. Um, I never were, again, not Monsanto. Um, but I, I, I worked at a, at a smaller pesticide company. Um, I think one of our pesticides uh, was co-produced uh, with Monsanto. So, like, like our pesticide made theirs. So you are a shill for Monsanto, yes, after no, all. I, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, but I, it, that, was, uh, I, I, that was one of the things I was told. But, no, um, in order to get FDA approval. or He's, um, he's anti-GMO, too. For, no, for we didn't make. <laughs> We didn't produce any GMOs. Um, we just produced uh, pesticides. But it's EPA approval for the pesticides, FDA approval for the GMOs. But you had to go through such an arduous process for approval. And it was years of testing. I mean, years. So like, whenever I hear someone say they're untested, um, you, haven't, you haven't done any uh, safety testing, they haven't been. I mean, it is, in some cases, decades. Um, when Dr. Oz uh, made his little hissy fit about the... Um, uh, about enlist duo, the new, as he called it, the GMO pesticide, saying it wasn't tested. Someone who worked at, I think it was Syngenta that produced that one. Um, he's like, we. The, per, someone posted on my page, we've done 11 years of testing on this. What's Dr. Oz talking about? So, I mean, there is is tons of testing. They go back and forth with the EPA, asking what you know, what do you need? What's what's necessary for this? Because we, you know, we're scientists. Where you know our our families are eating this too. We're we're eating this too. This is not like people forget. Scientists are people. <laughs> like it's not just some evil executive um, who's putting it out into the food supply. I don't know. I'm pretty sure I saw Alex Jones post something about how the New World Order all eats organic food while they poison the rest of us. I don't know. <laughs> Alex Jones seems a reputable, man. I mean, yeah, he no. Can <laughs> spot, he can spot a false flag from like 50 feet away. Well, I'm. A I, I tried to get him on, but I couldn't. So now now I'm here with you. <laughs> no, my my dog is a false flag. I got the dog just so I could appear cute and sweet. I I mean, I'm really just an evil reptilian, obviously. Just, yeah, it's, I'm sure Alex Jones is going to quote me on that now. <laughs> <laughs> See, so. science babe is an evil reptilian. <laughs> yeah, it's like I said, got the dog just so I could appear sweet and cuddly. You heard it here first. Uh, well, well, if you think GMOs fires people up, um, that's nothing compared to, I think, how the vaccine issue pops up. When I even post something in our forum, we have a forum on Facebook, um, the Lions of Liberty Forum, where we just kind of discuss a lot of our articles, a lot of current events. If I even reference the word vaccine, you know that thread is going to be hundreds of comments long. <laughs> so it, it, it is such an emotional issue. And it's understandable. I mean, we're talking about people's health, people's yeah. kids. I mean, it's obviously going to be an emotional issue. Um, on, on every side of it. So wh- why don't we get into that a little bit? What are the m- biggest misconceptions that you see as people having about vaccines? Oh, 
where where to start? Um, first of all, it doesn't cause autism, um, and people always think. I mean, let's go with um, the autism rates because people think that autism rates are rising. Uh, they are not. They've always probably been about somewhere between one and sixty and one and seventy. Now, think that people think they've well, once. Uh, you'll see graphics online saying you know autism rates used to be one in five thousand, and they've steadily gone up as we've given more vaccines. That's a correlation. It's not a causation. Now, once upon a time, uh, we used to say that we used to define autism as being deeply withdrawn and nonverbal. Now we've changed the definition of the disease. Now we have the autism spectrum. Um, and we also have included Asperger's as part of um, the diagnostic criteria um, for autism. So we've changed the definition. We've included more kids for the statistics. And we're, we're surprised <laughs> that we have a higher rate of, of diagnosis. Like do- doctors, um, are much better at diagnosing it. So, of course, we're getting more cases. Um, it's, I mean, it's going up. So, I mean, I think back to just, you know, the 80s um, and the early 90s in school and, and knowing, uh, you know, what we know now about autism. And I, I can, like, name, like, specific kids that might have been diagnosed. Like, my mom was a teacher back in the 70s, and she said, she's like, I can definitely think of a few kids that the way we diagnose now would have been diagnosed with, you know, with being on different, you know, spots in the spectrum. But like, that's, that's the thing. We've changed the definition. So of course, um, you know, we're, we're going to change the disease. Like once upon a time, it would have been called, you know, childhood schizophrenia or, you know, just being the weird kid in class. Now we're calling it autism. So of course we're adding more kids to it. It's not, you know, it's like they're, parents who really hate, um, you know, all of the stuff that they just don't understand. Um, they're saying, you know, it's something in the food supply or it's the vaccines. You know, it's, it's just, it's a d- disease that was always there that we didn't have a name for. I guess I know I went into an autism rant, but it's really related to the vaccines. That's the biggest thing people are afraid of. So um, people go after different um, ingredients in the vaccines. They'll always try to say it's aluminum or mercury. Um, we, you get you know, about a thousand times more, we'll address aluminum, you get about a thousand times more aluminum in an antacid tablet than you do in a vaccine. Um, mercury, it's not, you only get uh, mercury um, and in a, a, a state that isn't going to do anything to your body um, in, in the form of thimerosal in your flu shot. Every other vaccine doesn't have thimerosal in it. I believe it's, just, it's either in the flu shot or the MMR, um, and that's the only one. Everything else, no thimerosal. But it, after it was taken out of all the other shots, the rates of autism for a little while was still rising while we were still figuring out, you know, diagnostic criteria. So not related. In many ways, I think the autism thing is a red herring to the overall issue that, that I mean, and this is a, an issue that often gets connected to it. So it's t- certainly legitimate to address it on your yeah. end. But, uh, you know, I mean... Th- is there any legitimacy to the idea that v- vaccines can cause injuries at all? I mean, there have been many people that have actually been compensated for vaccine yeah. injuries. I know they, I'm sure you're well aware of this. Uh, you've heard you talk about it before, but you know, they have in 1986, they passed the national board. And I think uh, something like 2,500 people have been awarded in this sort of secret court. You can't sue a vaccine company in a regular court. You have to go through, through HHS and go to this special vaccine court. So wh- why do you think that court even exists? How did that come up? Is there any legitimacy to the idea that people do receive some sort of injury from vaccines sometimes there are people who have underlying conditions who can that can kind of be triggered by vaccines or things called Dravet syndrome where if you get a fever it will trigger a seizure and vaccines can occasionally trigger a fever um, and you know it's because your immune system is reacting um, and it's that's the thing is your immune system is getting a small reaction now the way we got kind of the idea for vaccines um, is because once upon a time there's a disease called cowpox um, which is a really you know it's it's not Cowpox, not so bad. If people got cowpox, they found that they wouldn't get smallpox. Smallpox, really horrible, lots of deaths. And that was kind of their their first uh, realization uh, that if um, you got a, a, a lessened strain of something that, um, I hope I'm explaining this correctly. If someone hears it and I, I explain this incorrectly, I apologize. But if that was kind of the first realization that if you got a lessened strain of something, that you were, that, that you were kind of inoculated um, to a, a more uh, severe form of something. Um, so that was, I mean, that was kind of the first, um, I hate to use this term, but the first organic vaccine was people <laughs> getting cowpox. Careful. Um, and not, you know what I mean? But, and then not yeah. getting, uh, and then not getting smallpox. Um, but that's the thing, um, that, that, that immunity happened, um, once, you know, first in nature, um, 
but that was that was where that idea came from like from there you know we we moved on and we and we gave those vaccines and no you know we we've, we've managed to wipe out smallpox from there and it's um it's it, it's been amazing to see um that people are are looking uh for symptoms but the um i people do occasionally have um it's people do occasionally have like a little sorry saying um, we're, I was on immune reaction. Sorry. I, like I said, good at sidetracking myself sometimes. Sure, I mean, even when I go in to get a shot, you know, I went traveling a few years ago and got some shots first. And even then they had me sit in the office for 10 minutes to make sure there was no, you know, no bad reaction yeah, to it. Exactly. You can't, you are having an immune reaction, um, to it. And like, like we don't have to, um, to say that, you know, anything else. I actually got my boosters, uh, my MMR and Tdap boosters last fall, and I'm really glad I did because I was at Disneyland on the days of the measles outbreaks. I, I live three miles from Disney, so I was a little pissed when I found out somebody brought their disease-ridden brats into Disney. <laughs> okay. Do we know how that outbreak actually started? Is that just because enough people weren't vaccinated? Because I know some of the people that got measles during that outbreak were actually vaccinated people. So why is that? Very few of the people um, who got the measles um, had been vaccinated. Uh, or sorry, I think it was I, it was something like less than five percent of the people who got um, who got the measles from that outbreak had their were, were completely up to date on their vaccines. Everyone else was unvaccinated. Measles is extremely virulent. Like if you have been in a room where someone coughed and had the measles within forty eight hours, you have a very good chance of you have about a ninety percent chance of getting it. So I mean, it's it's very easy to. I, I'm sorry if I pull those numbers out of the air, but that's I I think I mean. Oh no, I, you got them from from your uh, Monsanto overlords, right? Exactly. Yeah. No, <laughs> but no, I've seen, like it's it is one of the more violent. Ones. Like you, um, it's, it's much like the flu is easy to, to spread. Um, measles is much easier and that's, that's horrifying. Cause you know, it's, um, like whenever you hear someone describe these diseases as harmless childhood diseases, it's because they haven't seen them for a long time. Um, like measles, one in 20 cases of measles ends up giving someone pneumonia. Like pneumonia is the most common cause of death. Um, or, or the most common cause of death from a complication from the measles. There's also measles encephalitis where the disease spreads to the brain and someone basically turns into a vegetable and then will again sometimes die from brain swelling. So it's sometimes, sometimes people can go blind from it. Sometimes people can go deaf from it. Um, I have a friend, um, a nurse whose husband um, had the measles as a child and he's deaf um, from it. So, I mean, this is the, I, I mean, whenever I hear someone say these diseases are harmless, that really bothers me because they're calling a disease harmless. Well, yeah, we wouldn't call it a disease if it was completely harmless. <laughs> exactly. Diseases are not harmless. You don't, you don't take them to bed. <laughs> so, Ben, obviously you know where this is going. <laughs> yeah. You did, you did make a statement on, uh, when you were on Austin Peterson's show somewhat recently, the yeah. Freedom Report, and he asked you if, if you thought vaccines should be mandatory, and you said that they should be mandatory. So, why, before I question you further on that statement, why don't you just explain what you mean by that exactly and, and why you took that position? It's, well, I mean, first of all, I understand that there are some people, um, immunocompromised people, uh, people with certain conditions, uh, people who have had um, a legitimate vaccine reaction or an allergy to a component of vaccines um, who are exempt from this. Now, this, there is a very important reason why all the rest of us should get vaccinated. I think that a vaccine, it's your entranceway into uh, the rest of society. If you want to not get vaccinated, you can go live on a private island somewhere else. But... The um, getting vaccinated, like I, I think it's the, uh, I, I think it's the principle of non-aggression. Your right to, uh, to swing your fist kind of ends at my face. Your right to swing your disease-ridden bullshit ends at my immune system. Um, it's getting vaccinated is one of the, um, the easiest uh, things you can do uh, to keep yourself safe and the rest of society safe. Now I know. Um, being a libertarian means that you're looking out for, for yourself, uh, and, and it's it's quite a, a freedom-driven ideology. But at the same time, uh, uh, getting uh, getting vaccinated, it's really, as we've seen, uh, it not getting vaccinated can cause a lot more harm uh, to other people, even um, with, without uh, meaning to. Um, and it's it's not just you, it's it's uh, other people's children, and it's it can be a huge societal problem. So, I mean, 
I, I think we don't see it now because so many people just are vaccinated. But if everyone chose that same course of action of not vaccinating, um, we'd see a huge amount of these diseases come back. And I think people don't think about it because we haven't seen things like polio for 50 years. So well, it's, it's one thing to advocate as you are for people to vaccinate. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But when you actually state that you think it should be mandatory, what do you really mean by that? I mean, do, do you support a national law just requiring anyone to exist to be vaccinated? And, and- I think if... If you're going to send your kids to public school, I think they should be vaccinated. Okay, well, that, that's one thing. School is one thing. Yeah. But, I mean, when you when you say mandatory, to me, mandatory means law, means enforced by violence, means, okay. means no. would you send a mother to jail for not vaccinating her child? Would no. you? Ab- no. Okay. No. No, it's not. I would. I wouldn't enforce jail time. I think if you're if you're sending your child to public school, they need to be vaccinated. So, okay, because I think this actually displays a, a problem with our system, with our entire how we look at things and how we look at private property, because we're all kind of lumped together. They they have sort of socialized the school system. They've socialized all things really. Um, so you know, I think in a in a more free society where we maybe respected property rights, a lot of these things wouldn't be issues because schools could be private and every school could say, Hey, we're not going to allow you unless you have X, X, Y, and Z vaccinations. Other schools might say, Hey, we're free range parents and we don't give a crap. And you guys can all come in here with your measles and that's fine. Cause you're staying in, in your, you know, in your little, in your little school there. But I, I think it becomes difficult in our society where, well, basically everything is socialized and, and we kind of look to the government to, to decide all these things and not to the actual private property owners and that kind of thing. I mean, at the same time, they're um, they're offering like some places offer religious exemptions, and I think that we're uh, we're we're not a country that um, it's we we have a separation of uh, of church and state, and I think saying we're we're offering religious exemptions um, it says we're 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 conflating religion to something that should be interfering with science. That really bothers me. So I think getting rid of the religious exemptions says we're not letting giving religion a place in science, um, and that's that's a law that got shot down in two states already. See, to me, it's not about religion per se. It's not about the reason someone doesn't want to vaccinate. It's just about simply about rights. It's about the right to decide what to put in your body. It's about the right to decide what goes. In. And, and, and it does become difficult when we're talking about children because and it becomes difficult yeah. on both sides. I have, I have no reason to believe that someone that doesn't want to vaccinate their child is doing so out of malice. It, I think they're doing so out of no. at least a perceived good out of they are, their fear of the vaccine. And that's one of the hardest parts about this movement is I don't think these parents are bad human beings. Right. I think they th- I think they think they are doing something good and that's why they're so dangerous. Um, they like they are scared. Uh, they have like and the worst part is um, when you Google vaccines, the first thing that comes up is is the CDC's website. The second thing that comes up is Merkula, which is a website that is wrought with horrible information. Um, and, and I mean, you just it's like five more websites before you get to something with good information, with accurate information. So it's hard to get to good information on vaccines. Um, it's just it's damn near impossible because the, the Internet is just flooded with stuff sell, telling you that you're a bad parent if you vaccinate. Um, and that they're going to cause autism and they're going to cause horrible things for your children. And that Gardasil is, is going to, um, I think there was a really bad quote from Michelle Bachman saying that it, you know, gave a girl mental, uh, a, a mental handicap. I mean, there, there's so much misinformation um, about it on the Internet uh, that I, I think it's, it's a confusing place for parents. And I think they don't know um, what's going to happen if they vaccinate. So, you know, I urge parents to, to look at reputable sources of information um, when, when looking at vaccines. And there's no reason not to vaccinate unless your child is immunocompromised or has an allergy to a component in a vaccine. Um, you're, you're making the right choice for your child. You're making a scientifically sound choice for your child. Um, it's, you know, whether or not the state requires it. All right, Yvette, I've got just a couple more questions, but I want to take a minute to tell everyone out there about our sponsor, Health Excellence Select. Now, until last year, I was just like you guys. I saw my health insurance cost double and my deductible skyrocket thanks to the Obamacare health insurance mandates. Determined not to participate in this corporatist scheme, I sought an alternative and found out about health sharing, a fantastic concept in which your monthly fees go directly to pay the medical bills of others, not into the pockets of some crony capitalist fat cat. Health Excellence Select combines health sharing with a patient care personal assistant, 24-7 phone access to board-certified physicians, and discounts on dental, vision, and other benefits. The best part is that for most people, plans with Health Excellence Select are much more affordable than Obamacare insurance, and it meets the legal mandate, so you will not be fined for using it in lieu of insurance. That's Health Excellence Select. For more information, head over to lionsofliberty.com health. 
Do you think the government policies on vaccines help sort of play into this fear at all? Because like I said, the, the vaccine companies, they have a special exemption. You can't sue them directly if you believe there's an injury. So you go to the special vaccine court and, you know, it's not the same as a public court. It's a special proceeding. We don't, it's, there's not a public hearing here. So do you think the fact that it's sort of, uh, there's, there's not a lot of sunlight on it can co- sort of fuel that hysteria, fuel that paranoia? Because when something is, when we see companies getting special treatment from the government, whether it's legitimate or not, it can raise that, oh, wait, what's going on here? Is something shady going on here? So do you think that plays into it at all? That is a good question. Um, I'm not, here's the thing. The VAERS board is very uh, strange in how it handles cases. Basically, anyone can report any quote-unquote vaccine injury uh, to them and say, like, I mean, when I got my I got my MMR and Tdub on the same day, I got swelling at the injection site of one of them. I think I think it was the MMR. I'm not sure uh, which. Um, and the swelling in my arm didn't go down for like three weeks. It was it was pretty bad. If um, if I was um, you know a mother who decided I was going to um, you know to, to flip out about something like that, I could report to the VAERS board that I had a vaccine reaction, um, and they would record that in their statistics, you know, that it was a vaccine reaction. Um, and they would add that into, you know, the total number for the year of the, you know, of the vaccines that gave a reaction. They don't look for veracity of data. But they do compensate people for injuries. So how do they decide, decide who to compensate and how much? They look at, uh, I mean, there are some people who have very severe, I mean, rarely, um, they don't, I mean, I I don't uh, know how often it happens, but every so often somebody will have a severe reaction. And a lot of times it's based on uh, an underlying condition that's already there. Um, It's but when it happens, they look at the total cost of life care, the total, um, uh, you know, uh, the total need uh, based on life, because I mean, there was I saw a documentary yesterday. And, I mean, so this might be coloring uh, my my perception on this. I saw this documentary called Bots that was trying to claim that, of course, you know, everything from the food supply to the medical system was paid off, um, and it was it was you know some it was a very propaganda based film saying that you know Monsanto and every and the and Merck and every single. Um, uh, um, you know, company that sells either a medicine or or a pesticide is is you know horrible. Um, but the uh, um, there was a a woman whose child appeared to have been vaccine injured, and because they needed total life care, they were awarded seven million dollars. Because you know, for the rest of this child's life, they are dependent on someone. So I think it depends on the case. I think it depends on the vaccine injury. Was that a legitimate injury from the vaccine? I or, or, I don't or you don't know or I, I don't know. I don't know if they were actually vaccine injured or if um you know, if there was an underlying condition, like that's the thing. It's like, it doesn't appear that people have a legitimate vaccine injury often. Like, it seems like it happens once in a while. Do you think that this program sh- should even exist? I mean, because to me, just ha- just taking it out of the public realm, taking it out of, you know, where they say you can't actually sue a vaccine manufacturer through the regular process, that that just really fuels a- any side of this debate. It takes it out, it takes the sunlight off of it. I, like, I feel like... Mm. I mean, I know it's a good question. Like, I, uh, I, I think it's good that we have uh, that fund there because, I mean, having, um, like, I mean, I like my liberty as as a libertarian. I I think you should be able to go after anyone you want. Um, as someone who sees that um, that having herd immunity is kind of, I hate to, like I said, the 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 libertarian in me hates that I'm saying this, but I think herd immunity is kind of a public good. Go ahead and hate me for saying that, <laughs> but I mean, the um, think about the people who are immunocompromised. Uh, think about the people who cannot vaccinate. Um, you know, it's like, do, do you do you know anybody who has an organ transplant and is on and is on immunosuppressants and can't get their full uh, vaccine schedule and would love to? Do you know anybody who's on chemotherapy um, and who has a shot immune system and can't vaccinate? Like, these are people who thank you for getting your uh, your shots. Um, there's there is a reason why uh, we get vaccines uh, or like the rest of us get vaccines, even ah. though like we don't see measles around us anymore. Um, it's it's because like there are, you know, the, these viruses can pop up around us and the people, um, you know, who can't vaccinate really need us. But uh, back to the bears board, um, like if if somebody if every frivolous lawsuit just went straight 
uh, to the vaccine manufacturer, they uh, there's a chance they'd be out of business because people, you know, for every sn- you know every paranoid mom with every sniffle would go straight to the manufacturer. See, to me, it's like if they're frivolous and there's no actual claim there, I want that stuff out there because if you can disprove it in court, and now we have these public cases, now I can say, look, vaccine people, look, it wasn't. We proved that this wasn't correct, but when it goes into the secret court, now we say, oh well, they gave them money, so I guess vaccine injuries are, are legitimate. This is very no. That's that's a very good point. I'm not here's the, I'm not sure the origins of it, and I'm not sure um, where uh, why they chose to uh, to set it up that way. Um, it's uh, and I don't think it's I don't think there's perni- uh, there are any pernicious um, uh, there's any pernicious reasoning behind it. Um, I think it was just set up that way because there are so many manufacturers of vaccines, um, and kids will go in and get multiple shots in one day. Um, it would be it, it would be a little bit of a, a, a mon, um, of a, a lion to, uh, to to try to get it all done, um, or to, to try to sue multiple manufacturers. Um, so they just set it up as a vaccine board. I think that that might be part of it. Gotcha. Well, Yvette, there, there are so many issues we could discuss. I'd love to get into your homeopathy stuff and all that stuff, and maybe we'll do it again sometime. But I don't want to keep you here all day. But I really do appreciate you coming on and talking about these stuff, uh, addressing these issues with us, because, you know... Thank you for having me. The, the issue of rights and the issue of science can often get merged. And to me, they're, they're separate conversations. Um, when you have a, a scientific sort of view on things, that's that's one area. And then when we get into philosophy and the issue of rights, that's another area. And, and somehow, in libertarianism, I think think in, in many ways libertarians are seen as just rejecting everything that the government has ever done or said so that's why a lot of the anti-vax anti-gmo stuff all sort of gets lumped in and i think it's important to look for the facts regardless and look at things through a factual prism and try to get the propaganda to the side and and figure out what the real truth is and and that and only by doing that in in whatever case can we actually come to a, a logical sort of philosophical conclusion about rights and about how that all translates into individual rights Absolutely. I mean, there's it, I, I I know vac- uh, the vaccine things and wanting everyone to get vaccinated. Like it sounds like I'm stepping on people's toes. I want people to understand the science behind this is sound. And I think when people do, they're going to be willing to vaccinate and they're going to be willing to say, I, I'm going to be part on this or take part on this. So that's uh, I guess that's my final piece on that. <laughs> Great. Well, Yvette, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. Before I let you go, why don't you give one little roundup of where everybody can find your blog, find you on social media, and you know, feel free to plug anything else you got going on. Um, let's see. You can find me at facebook.com slash sciencebabe. Um, I'm also at scibabe.com, and you can find me at Twitter um, at sciencebabe. Wait, do you have one book you would recommend to people who might just be coming familiar with you about whether it's science, whether it's libertarianism, however you want to, whatever you want to do? You know, I, I'm just going to recommend uh, the Kindly Inquisitors by Jonathan Rauch. It's a it's a solid libertarian uh, piece, um, and it's it, it's actually Pendulet is gonna, is recording the uh, uh, he's recording the audio book for it. And he's also writing Pen is also writing the forward for my books. So. Oh, very cool! That's an awesome get. I thought uh, well, he's a good friend of Pen's a, a good friend of mine. He was friends. I, he was a friend of mine before I was the science babe. So oh, cool. I figured that that should give me some libertarian cred with you guys, right? <laughs> So, but that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, the kindly inquisitors by Jonathan Rouse is a really wonderful book. Yvette Guinevere, thank you so much for coming on and be sure to check out cybabe.com. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. Hey guys, Mark Claire here, lionsofliberty.com, where we strive to advance the ideas of liberty daily. We bring you the morning roar. That's right. Every Monday to Friday, we'll have a brand new edition of the Morning Roar, where we provide a roundup of some news stories that you may not find in the mainstream media or even in your typical social media news feed. We find stories that relate to the ideas of liberty and provide you with our liberty perspective on them. We wrap it all up every Friday with Felony Friday, where our own John Odermatt goes out and takes a look at some sort of felony. There's felonies committed every day, you know, whether it's a felony committed by the police, a politician, or even an average citizen. You can find all of this and so much more over at LionsOfLiberty.com, advancing the ideas of liberty daily. Your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed my interview with the science babe, Yvette Guinevere. Be sure to check out her blog over at SciBabe.com. And it's interesting to me because libertarianism as a political or philosophical movement should really be atheist when it comes to taking a position on, on specific scientific matters. 
science is a different field in a way. It's a search for truth about the material world, about you know finding the correct scientific answers to things. It shouldn't really be the same as taking a political position on something, but libertarianism does seem to attract a lot of the sort of anti-crowds, the anti-GMO folks, the anti-vax folks, and I think a large part of that may be for good reason, as this is the philosophy that should not be advocating the use of force to push these things on people, to push certain vaccines on people, or to promote specific GMOs from specific companies such as Monsanto. But we also need to be very careful not to just lump bold scientific or maybe anti-scientific claims into our political positions. Our political positions ultimately need to come from a strong grasp of philosophy and a a rigorous philosophical look at things and look at the use of force and how that should be applied to our fellow man. But I think that the structure of government today, how we have these organizations, these monopolies like the FDA, controlling things like vaccines, controlling things like the kind of food we eat, and it often does become a revolving door between a lot of people in these industries, people that work for Monsanto, people that work for Merck, and between that and the FDA and the people that set the rules about how these products should be regulated and marketed. You know, we have a secret vaccine court. Maybe it's not secret. We know it exists, but the hearings aren't public. The findings aren't public. Every claim about a vaccine, whether it's true or not, has to go through the Department of Health and Human Services. And you know, we can say those those claims aren't valid and, and they're not legitimate. And maybe they're not. But when we have this sort of secret and sort of like almost like a black market justice system in a way, even though the government's running it, to look at the effects of vaccines, I think that just clouds the issue for everybody. And if anything, it really helps promote the conspiracies, the conspiracies about vaccines, about who knows, they say they're putting, what, microchips in the vaccines now or or giving us AIDS or giving us cancer through the vaccines. I'm not saying that's true, but people are out there saying it. And when you have these sort of protective systems, these cronious systems where certain companies are protected from prosecution, protected by certain regulations, Regulations, well, it's only going to fuel those conspiracies. It's only going to cloud the issue further. That's why we need sunlight. We need things to be in the public. And we have a crony capitalist structure that tries to cover things up, that gives certain companies patents over their seeds. And you now I'm sorry for a vet, but I do, patents to me are in no way something that's a free market. Patents could not exist in a true free market. Patents punish anybody who independently discovers something. It's not the same as a copyright or even a trade secret. You know, somebody could patent the wheel and then somebody across the world could invent the wheel. But if somebody had that patent on the wheel first, well, you know, the guy halfway across the world that also figured it out, well, now he can't use that wheel. And that's a very basic example. And I know vaccines are more complicated, you can say, and and different things are more complicated than that. But at the end of the day, when we look at things from the perspective of the use of force, of the use of a aggression on our fellow man. Well, that's what's not acceptable to libertarians, or at least it shouldn't be. We need to draw some lines somewhere. And I'm glad Yvette was able to clarify her position about mandatory vaccinations, because it's one thing for schools, and and we can argue that the structures of schools are kind of dicey, because they are publicly funded, they are socialized in many ways. But in a society that actually respected private property, you know, places like Disneyland, places where people are congregating large amounts, places where Children could be at risk, such as schools, such as parks, such as doctor's offices could require certain vaccines for people to come in, and there'd be nothing wrong with that. But that's very different than saying vaccines are mandatory from the government to even exist in the world, to live, to not have your rights violated, to not have your door knocked down. And I'm glad Yvette was able to clarify that even though she has said in the past she favors mandatory vaccines, she really doesn't favor mandatory vaccines because, as she said, she doesn't want a law. She doesn't want to send mothers to jail for not vaccinating their children, and, and to use the term mandatory. Well, that is actually what that would be if it was legally mandatory. So I'm glad we were able to clarify that and look at that issue a little deeper. Just like we don't want to necessarily promote being anti-GMO per se or anti-vaccine per se. You don't want to just blindly accept that everything we are told by by certain companies and by the, the government and by certain government entities are exactly fact because there are many factors determining why certain things are put out there, why certain things are put on the market, why certain companies are protected in certain ways. And it really takes a lot. It makes the situation very difficult when we can't necessarily trust the institutions that are instilled with and have a monopoly over protecting us from certain things. But what these issues do is give us an opportunity to filter these issues in our conversations with other people through the lens of liberty and try to look at them through 
the outlook that respects individual rights, respects property rights, and looks to see how these issues could be parsed in a more free society, which of course is what we strive for here on each and every episode of this here Lions of Liberty podcast and each and every day over at our website, lionsofliberty.com. If you're a new listener, if you found us through the science, babe, and you find this stuff interesting, go check us out at lionsofliberty.com. Go check out our back episodes at lionsofliberty.com slash podcast for the full archive of this show. And if you are a fan of the show, there are so many ways you can help us out. Did you know we have a YouTube channel? You can find us on YouTube now, too. You can find us on Google+, Facebook.com slash Lions of Liberty. Join our forum, the Lions of Liberty Forum. We'll link to that in the show notes on Facebook. Find us on Twitter, at Lions of Liberty. If you want to subscribe to the show, to subscribe to us on iTunes, on Stitcher Radio. You can leave us a review. That would be nice, too. Hint, hint. And, of course, you can always listen to us on the weekends on LibertyTalk.fm at 6 p.m. Eastern on Saturday and Sunday throughout the week at the Liberty Radio Network, LRN.fm. Next week, I will have a couple interesting guests, guys, that aren't really big names in the Liberty Movement, guys you might not have heard of. But, guys, I am very excited to be speaking with starting this coming Tuesday with a gentleman by the name of James Newcomb, who will be explaining to us why... As a musician currently serving the Army, stationed in South Korea, he is currently a conscientious objector trying to get out of his service for philosophical reasons. So we're really looking forward to talking to James next week. And until then, folks, I need you to live long and live free, my friends. (laughs) 